folks coming? We got John. Let's see, do I call it videoing? We are videoing, is that a word? Uh, I think we're on the air. Okay. <laughs> cool. Hi, Hi folks. folks. <laughs> Welcome to the world of technology. All right, good to go. I wish I was an opera singer. I could do some uh, elevator music. All right. Looks like we're good to go. So let's just pretend. Hi, folks. <laughs> Welcome to the world of All right. Good to go. <laughs> You're going to give me my five, four, three, two, one? We're on the air. We're, we're on. All right. We're live, Andy. <laughs> Appreciate y'all's uh, prayer for us. <laughs> Please. We're uh, trying some new technology today, <laughs> and we just <clears throat> didn't quite have our act together. But God is a God of grace. Yes, I'm, I'm glad I wasn't picking my nose. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right. Well, my name is Dr. Andy Woods. Don't tell him who I am. <laughs> um, we want to welcome you. Yeah, we want to welcome you back to uh, Pastor's Point of View, which is our live feed we do here at Sugarland Bible Church. Uh, from 2 to 3 p.m. Central, but since we're starting at 2.25, let's just change it today from 2.25 to 3.25 Central. That sounds like a plan. And I'm here once again with my friend and colleague, associate pastor, fellow elder, uh, Dr. Jim McGowan. Hi, folks. And uh, the last few times we were together, we dealt with some cultural issues we dealt with the same-sex marriage issue and yeah. civil rights yeah. on Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. We dealt with the whole subject of abortion on yeah. Sanctity of Life Sunday. And I think the last time we were together, we, we got together and got back to theology. We talked about the kingdom. Right. And Brother Jim, we have got a hot issue today. In fact, this issue is so hot theologically, uh, when I touch my paper, my... My fingertips are being singed here. And that's the subject of the pre-trib rapture doctrine. Say what? <laughs> wow. And yes. just to kind of orient people, um, we have our missionaries at our church answer a questionnaire. Yes. Just to see where they're at theologically, make sure they're still on the reservation. Right. It's a questionnaire we encourage you to use uh, with your missionaries and your church and your pastors and your leaders but can you educate folks one more time just to find that questionnaire? Absolutely. I think it's, I think it's about 43 questions. Correct. We're yes. on question 24, so we're actually making progress. We're, we're moving right along. Yeah. Well, folks, if you'd like to download the questionnaire, just go to the Sugarland Bible Church website. It's slbc.org. And at the top of the screen, you'll see a banner there. Go to the uh, Ministries button and click on that. You'll see a little drop down then and select uh, missions. And when that page opens up down at the bottom of that page, you'll see a button that has the, our questionnaire on it. And we encourage you to download it and utilize it for your own benefit. So we're on question 24 today. And question 24, we're not gonna read it quite yet, but it, you'll, you'll see there it deals with the subject of the pre-trib rapture right. doctrine. We at Sugarland Bible Church embrace promote, advocate, celebrate the doctrine of the pre-trib rapture. Amen. That the church is going to be raptured before the tribulation period yes. starts. And of all the, the uh, doctrines in the Bible, the level of hatred towards this particular doctrine is, to me, it's, it's staggering. Yeah, the vitriol. The vitriol. Amazing. So what I want to do is I want to read a quote. Now, we have some video shoots in just a second. We're not doing the videos quite yet, but... I just want to read to you this quote from Barbara Rossing, who wrote a book called The Rapture Exposed, and she is a Lutheran professor at a Lutheran school in Chicago. Her resume theologically is very impressive. She has a master's degree and an undergraduate degree from the Ivy League. So 
so she's supposedly a big heavy hitter in the world of theology. She wrote a book called The Rapture Exposed, the message in the hope, uh, in the, the of message hope, yeah. of hope in the book of Revelation. Mm-hmm. And I just want to read this quote because it shows you the level of antagonism that the theological world has towards the rapture. Yeah. Would you mind reading that for us? Happy to. And the title sort of gives you a clue right away, doesn't That's it? That's right. Here's what she says. The rapture is a racket. Whether prescribing a violent script for Israel or survivalism in the United States, This theology distorts God's vision for the world. This theology is not biblical. We're not raptured off the earth, nor is God. No, God has come to live in the world through Jesus. God created the world. God loves the world. God will never leave the world behind. So it's an astonishing, astonishing quote. She says, first yeah. of all, the rapture is a, is a racket, wow. which is a, a term you apply to <clears throat> mobsters, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, if, if you believe in the rapture, somehow you, you don't love the world because the world is left behind mm-hmm. to experience the wrath of the tribulation period. Yeah. Uh, she doesn't really seem to understand that in the tribulation period, God is purifying the earth in preparation for his kingdom, right. which will be on this earth. But this is the sort of mindset that people have concerning the rapture. It's, it's immediate antagonism. Yeah, it is. Now, here's another quote. This is not our video quite yet, but this is a quote from Rick Wiles, and he has a ministry called uh, True News, which to me is one of the most mislabeled programs probably on air today. Mm. And just read that quote there from uh, Rick Wiles, if you don't mind. All right. Here's what Mr. Wiles says. I personally do not believe that by the year 2020, any credible person will be teaching this secret pre-trib rapture doctrine. I think the events that are coming in the next five years will utterly destroy the doctrine. So if you believe in the pre-trib rapture doctrine, you're not credible. Mm -hmm. Um, This quote sort of cracked me up. He says, I don't believe by the year 2020 anybody will be teaching this. Well, maybe that's because the rapture will have occurred by then. Hey, wouldn't that be great? We'll all be gone. Uh, he says the events that are coming in the next five years will utterly destroy the doctrine. Mm-hmm. And you'll notice, and we're going to play some video of him in just a moment, but you notice how he keeps referring to it as the secret pre-trib rapture right. doctrine. Right, I did notice that. And you'll, you'll hear that in some of his video that we're going to play. Yeah. I don't really think we teach it's a secret because the world is going to see everybody missing. That's right. Once the rapture occurs. It's a secret in the sense that it's only applicable to the church. Mm -hmm. Uh, Paul, when he aims the rapture passages, talks about those in Christ. Right. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. But certainly it will have a worldwide effect uh, because the world will see all of these missing people that were once there. Maybe it's a secret to him. Yeah, maybe it's a secret to him. Now, um, let's go ahead and play this this, uh, audio. This is from his... uh, True News Program, and let's let's go ahead and play this. And you can I, I'm playing this just to show the tenor and the tone. Mm-hmm. Isn't it interesting, Doc? The same years, all right. You, all right. The, the the secret pre-trib rapture story and Christian Zionism. That's a two-headed monster. Monster. <laughs> yeah. It's a two-headed freak monster. Okay, they come together. Both of them come together. Because they were started by the same people. The Christian Zionists started the pre-trib rapture doctrine. And this was was seed planted decades ago, but it came into full fruit within the last 30 years. They had to create the pre-trib rapture doctrine to justify Christian Zionism. That's where it all came from. But isn't it interesting that in the recent decades where the American Evangelical Church has been taken over by Christian Zionism, that the American Evangelical Church has lost its flavor. Yes. It's lost its saltiness. It is of no use anymore to God in this country. Right. In fact, things are worse off now than they were 30 years ago. We've become a pagan nation. We're Babylon. We're Babylon, and it happened on the watch of the Christian Zionists. I'm laying it on your doorstep, Christian Zionists. You 
are the cause of America's decline. Those are strong words. They're Rick. strong words, and I mean it. They took control of the churches in America, the Christian Zionists. They changed the gospel. They took Jesus off the cross. They replaced the cross with the Star of David. They took the focus off God and holiness. They put it all on a piece of land in the Middle East. And America has gone to hell. America has gone to hell. We've become a pagan, heathen nation because the Christian Zionists have taken our eyes off Jesus. Tomorrow, maybe that's what I'm going to talk about tomorrow. Because I don't feel like talking about the stupid news. Yeah. And maybe we just need to talk about Cyrus Schofield and the origins of the secret pre-trib rapture. Because, you know, every time I say secret pre-trib rapture, I'll get 50 emails saying, Rick, I believe in the rapture and it's not a secret. Oh, yes, it is. You don't understand what you believe. They teach a secret rapture that Jesus is going to come back secretly only for the select few that are saved. He's going to take them out secretly. Nobody's going to know about it. You just, they're all going to disappear. And then all hell breaks loose and things get weird after that. All right. That's when the Antichrist comes out and all kinds of stuff happens. That's not what the Bible says. No, all right? not at all. But that comes with that doctrine. And it's all based around Christian Zionism. Well, hey, we probably said enough today <laughs> to generate about 10,000 emails. You, you All right, Brother Jim. Well, what do you think about all that? Wow, we're, <laughs> we're, we're really bad, aren't we? Yeah, and it's really not until you actually uh, listen to what these people are saying that you realize the hatred oh my that goodness. they have towards the doctrine of the rapture. Yeah, it's absurd. So you notice that in this citation, if you can call it that, I would call it more of a rant. Yeah, a rant. That's what He's it was. linking Zionism the belief in a future for Israel, right. which we embrace because that's in the Bible, yeah. with the, the doctrine of the rapture. He mm -hmm. thinks both are concoctions of man. Mm -hmm. They came about at the same time. And he says, if you believe this, you no longer are preaching the cross. <laughs> and somehow mm -hmm. you're responsible for the decline of America. In yeah. fact, he said because of this doctrine, America has gone to, quote, hell, close quote. Um, you, you know, when he said that, I couldn't help but remember uh, a former, our former pastor, our former president's pastor. It almost sounded like the same thing he was yeah, saying. Yeah, you're probably talking about uh, Jeremiah yeah, Wright. Yeah, Jeremiah Wright. Mm -hmm. I yeah. mean, it sounded very similar to that. Right. And uh, it's sort of like saying, you know, uh, the, the rooster crows and the sun comes up. <laughs> so therefore, the rooster crowing causes the sun to come up. I mean, they both happen around the same time. So, yeah, yeah. You, and it's it's <clears throat> it's filled with ad hominem attacks. It's yes. filled with logical fallacies. Yeah. And then at the end, he kind of pompously sits there with his Bible. He kind of pulls it up to his chin, and he says, "You know what? I'm not even going to talk about the stupid news tomorrow," yeah. which is a very strange thing to yeah. say because yeah. his program is called uh, True News. Yeah. You know? Is it true stupid news? Uh, I guess so. True news? Or? So he wants to do an expose on the, what he calls the secret rapture. Wow. And he wants to do an expose on um, you know, Schofield and people that right. supposedly yeah, the brought this Schofield. to America. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this idea that Schofield and Darby and these people, they invented the rapture, that to me is like saying Martin Luther invented sola fide. Mm hmm yeah. I mean, Martin Luther, what he did is he retrieved sola fide from the scripture. Right. And that's what Schofield, <laughs> exactly. uh, Darby, and the rest of them did. That's exactly but right. But to him, it's a conspiracy theory, and it's sort of linked with Christian Zionism, yeah. and it's part of the decline of America. Um, and it's sad that people like this even have a, have a program. It is. But I just wanted people to see that because I wanted to see them the antagonism towards the rapture. And uh, cheer up, folks. It's about to get worse. Let me, in just a minute, play a clip from the old Hannity and Combs show. I don't know if you ever saw ah, that. Ah, yes. I remember that. Now, Combs, the liberal, is no longer with us. They're interviewing here Christopher Hitchens, 
uh, as you're going to see a very antagonistic person who is no longer with us either. Um, and they're going to be talking about another man who's no longer with us, who died in 2007, Jerry Falwell. So this is about 11 years, 10 years or so old. And it's a debate they had <coughs> related to the death of Jerry Falwell. When Jerry Falwell died in 2007, Hitchens got on the air the very day without giving the family any time to grieve. I remember this, yeah. And immediately started attacking Jerry Falwell as a demagogue, yeah. and it's, it, we're glad to be rid of him. And yes. so Hannity and Combs, Hannity here <clears throat> particularly, is sort of confronting Hitchens on his very uh, callous mm -hmm. attitude. Yeah. And what Hitchens does here reminds me exactly of something right out of Revelation 11, where the two witnesses mm -hmm. are going to be killed on the city streets of Jerusalem, and they're not going to be given a proper burial mm -hmm. because they tormented the yeah. inhabitants of the earth through yeah. their proclamations. Hitchens apparently was so tormented by some of the things that Jerry Falwell said that he didn't want to give the family proper mourning time. He wanted to criticize them. Now... What I find interesting, as you listen to this, it goes about, I don't know, a minute and a half, two minutes, something like that. Listen to the crimes of Jerry Falwell in the eyes of Christopher Hitchens. Because yeah. he's going to cite the reasons he hates Jerry Falwell so much. And I want people to listen to that evidence because it relates to our subject. So uh, let's, right. let's go ahead and play that. And here we go. Here we go. If you compare his life, you know, there are a lot of good atheist communists out there like Stalin and Mao and Pol Pot and, you know, they slaughtered millions. Jerry, Jerry Falwell slaughtered nobody in his life. He may have misspoke once or twice, but he devoted his life to his religion. Do you have nothing good to say about him at all? No, I, I repeat, um, Jerry Falwell lived on uh, hatred and superstition and bigotry. He, he preached dislike of people whose lives he knew nothing about. He raised money from credulous so you don't know anything about his life? Now, excuse me, sir. You can either ask me on and, have, and ask my opinion, or you may not. But I don't have to be here if you're going to take that attitude. Well, you could leave. You spent the first half by saying I had no right to the opinion you'd asked me on to express. Now, you're tiring me out. I repeat, though. No, what I said is your opinion was thoughtless. What you wrote was crude and mean and hateful. That's yes, what I took, said. You took up all the time for my answer with your long rather unlettered question. Oh, okay. Jerry Falwell oh. made, a, made a career out of sponsoring dislike and superstition, said that people he didn't like were going to hell, said the United States deserved to be attacked by Islamic fascists, said he believed that people would be raptured into heaven, leaving all the rest of us to wallow behind. I, I think his death is a, is a deliverance. And if you heard it with your own words. Wow. Um, Christopher Hitchens, the atheist, doesn't want to give Jerry Falwell and his family mourning respects. No. And then he starts to listen, list his crimes. Yeah. And so here comes the litany after he calls Sean Hannity's response unlettered yeah. in sort of an arrogant, yeah. arrogant way. Uh, Jerry Falwell preached hatred against people he didn't like, supposedly. He promoted superstition, which I guess that's Christianity. Mm, yeah. He blamed the, uh, the homosexual community for 9-11. Now, that would be something, you know, that he probably shouldn't have said. And uh, we all know that both Pat Robertson and Jerry Falwell kind of stepped out of bounds a few times. Sure. And they were corrected properly by the Christian community itself. Right. But as he's going through this list, the part of it that's interesting to me is Hitchens brings up the fact that Jerry Falwell believed in a rapture. Yeah. And that certain folks are going to be raptured to heaven, leaving the rest of us. I guess he's admitting there he's not a Christian. Of course, of course, his brother, if I have it right, became a Christian. Is that right? Uh, wow. If I have that right. But uh, Jerry Falwell preached this doctrine that we're going to be raptured to heaven and the rest of us are going to be left behind, which is basically what we're promoting here, pre-tribulationalism. And that becomes justification for what? Becomes justification for uh, not allowing a family 24 hours to mourn before you start criticizing yeah. someone you disagree with. I mean, the level of hatred, you know, 
I mean, I'm sort of of the school, school of thought that you can disagree with people on a lot of different things, but you don't wish ill on them. That's correct. And you don't see this in this atheist Christopher Hitchens. And of Jerry Falwell's supposed crimes <clears throat> meriting him this dislike is his belief in a pre-tribulational rapture. Yeah. So there you heard it from uh, Barbara Rossing, mm. uh, Rick Wiles, Christopher Hitchens himself, yeah. that this pre-trib rapture doctrine is almost devilish, it's almost demonic. Well, it sounded to me like he almost called it hate speech. He didn't say those words, but right. that's what it sounded like right. where he was going. And what's tragic is you get on the internet today and you do some research on the pre-trib rapture doctrine. This is the type of oh, yes. animosity that you get. That's right. Now, people that have different theolog eschatological views than ours, you know, I like to critique their ideas. Right. But I don't think we've ever gotten in front of a camera and preached hatred against people. Right. And yet, this is what you're getting from anti-rapture uh, uh, advocates today. Right, and right. so, why do you think that is? I mean, why is the rapture doctrine so hated? Do you have any theories on it? Well, I, I, one thing that Satan has always been against is any yeah. teaching that talks about a return of the Lord Jesus Christ to right. the planet, right? Right. So, or to, to come and to, to redeem his people. Yeah. So, you know, it's just like the rest of prophecy. He's done everything he can to, to get us, to get our minds off of prophecy altogether. Yeah. Because he doesn't want us thinking about end times events because he knows his time is short. Right. That's a, that's a good explanation. You know, I'm sort of the, of the view that lost man always suppresses what's true. Well, that's what the scriptures say. Yeah. Romans 1. Yeah. And so the fact that these lost people, now, Wiles claims to be a believer. I don't really know where he stands with the Lord. But these people uh, are harboring animosity in their hearts towards something that's true. It's the mm -hmm. blessed hope of the church. Yes, it is. And um, I think that may be the reason it's under attack, because it's true. Well, yes. In fact, the reason, one of the reasons I believe the rapture to be true is the level of hatred it, ingener it mm -hmm. generates. Yeah. I mean, why would something false be hated that much. Yeah. So having said all that, that's just kind of our introduction. Um, why don't we go ahead now and read our question. Uh, <laughs> all right. It says, we divide it into two parts, uh, 24A, 24B, mm -hmm. and these all relate to the rapture doctrine. And we're trying to figure out today, is the rapture doctrine that everybody seems to scorn is this a biblical truth or not? Or did someone just make it up? Did yeah. Schofield or, or whoever just make this up? Did Tim LaHaye just make this mm -hmm. up? Or is it actually in the Bible? So go ahead and read, if you could, 24A. Uh, All right, uh, question 24A in our questionnaire says this. Is there a difference between the rapture and the second coming? Okay, is there a difference between the rapture and the second coming? Now we're going to put up a chart. I think this would be number three in our numbering system. And do you have that chart there? Mm -hmm. let's, let's hold this up. This chart here shows you why we believe in a rapture. We believe in a rapture because the second coming passages are described differently. That's right. Uh, some passages describe the return of Christ one way. Mm -hmm. Some passages describe the return of Christ a different way. And if you care about details, what you have to do is you, you begin to see that these, these can't be talking about the same event. Right. Um, and so what we do is we divide this, the second advent of Christ into two parts. May I interrupt you just quickly? Absolutely. Would you not agree with me that, what, that what's on this chart right here, the average Christian doesn't understand? that they don't make a distinction and causes all kinds of problems right? in terms of their understanding and interpretation of Scripture? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Let me, let me give another example before we, before we start moving through the chart. Um, you go into the Old Testament, okay? You've got some passages that talk about Jesus suffering and dying. Correct. Like Isaiah 53. Yes. You've got other passages mm -hmm. like Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, talking about him ruling and reigning. Correct. So those two can't be talking about the same event. That's right. Uh, they're described differently. So in hindsight, we know that the coming of Christ is two parts to it. Yes. The first coming, where he suffers and dies for the sins of the world, and the second coming, which is yet future, which he rules and reigns. Amen. So why can't I take that same logic 
to locate two different comings of Christ predicted in the pages of the Old Testament and apply that to second coming passages That's right. in the New Testament mm-hmm. primarily. Yeah. And when you really start to look at everything that the Bible says about the second coming, Old Testament and New Testament, you see that the second coming is described different ways. That's right. So going back to this chart here, and folks can look up these verses on their own. We have them there mentioned. But some passages talk about Christ coming in the air. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17. In other words, His feet never touch the earth. That's right. But Zechariah 14, verse 4 says when He comes back, His feet are going to touch the Mount of Olives. Mm-hmm. It's going to split in two. Yes. Some passages, 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 17, talk about Him coming for His saints. Mm-hmm. Other passages, Revelation 19, verse 14, talk about Him coming with His saints. Yes. Paul, when he describes the rapture, 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 18, says, comfort one another with these words. It's supposed Mm -hmm. to be a blessing. Right. Well, other passages talk about Jesus Christ coming back with violent judgment. That's a big difference there. Big difference. Is it a blessing or a judgment? Yeah. Revelation 19, verse 15. Uh, Some passages talk about when Christ comes back, He's only coming back for those in Christ. That's right. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. It only affects the believer. That's right. Blesses the believer. Other passages, like Revelation 19, verse 15, say that when Christ comes back, it's going to, a, it's going to be a rescue operation for the believers on the earth. Mm-hmm. And simultaneously, it's going to be a time of violent judgment for unbelievers. Right. So you start looking at these differences, they can't be talking about the same event. <laughs> That's right. It's, they've got to be talking about two comings. Now, Rick Wiles and these others don't like this, but I want to see in this level of uh, uh, hatred that we're in for this doctrine why it's completely rational or logical to believe in a rapture. Let's uh, go ahead and switch the chart here, and we, this takes us to, I think, number four mm-hmm. in our numbering system, and you can see how these... Uh, Differences continue. The rapture is what we would call an invisible event. And what I mean by that is it affects only the church. Right. But the second coming, Revelation 1, verse 7, says that when Jesus Christ comes back, it's going to be visible to the whole world. Correct. It says every eye will see Him. Yes. Some passages talk about Christ returning, and it's announced by an archangel, Mm -hmm. the trump of an archangel. Yep. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 16. Other passages say that when He comes back, He's coming back with myriads of angels. Mm -hmm. Some passages, when it talks about the return of Christ, says that's when we receive our resurrected body. Right. Amen. Amen to that. I can't wait. Other passages say that when Jesus Christ comes back, there's no mention of a resurrection at all. Mm -hmm. That's right. The rapture is a rescue operation for the church. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 1.10 says we're to wait for Him. He's coming back to rescue us yes. from the wrath which is to come. But right. the second advent is a rescue operation for then believing Israel, yes. who is being pursued by the Antichrist mm-hmm. in the midst of the tribulation period. And I've seen writers and speakers <clears throat> and authors and presenters develop far more lengthy lists than what we've presented. But this at least gives people an idea here what we're talking about. Uh, You can't take all the second coming passages and as Charlie Clough likes to say, ram, jam, and cram them into (laughs) one event. Right. The more you're concerned about literal interpretation, the more you're concerned about details, the more you see that these are completely two distinct events. Well, I think you have to add the one word that we normally add to that when we say literal. You have to add the word consistent literal yeah. interpretation because if you're not consistent, then you're not going to be intellectually honest when right. you approach the text. And you see, all we've done, Brother Jim, with our beliefs in the end times is we've taken the Protestant reformers' hermeneutic. That's right. Which Luther and yeah. Calvin and others used to reclaim from uh Layers of allegorization, mm-hmm. the, the sola scriptura, sola fide, yep. sola Christus, yes. by faith alone, by Christ alone, the scripture alone. Yes. And how do they retrieve those doctrines? Through a literal interpretation. That's right. 
So all we're doing is taking their hermeneutic and applying it to prophecy. Yeah. Right? That's right. So if you don't want to allegorize prophecy, you clearly see that the second coming has two phases. Yes. First, Christ comes in the rapture to rescue the church from the tribulation period itself. And then he comes again at the end of the tribulation period to rescue Israel and bring violent judgment to the earth. Right. So no big deal, right? You wouldn't think it would be. Uh, and you wonder why people hyperventilate about this <laughs> and blame us for the decline of America because right. we teach yeah. this. I'm not sure how you, you, you associate that idea there. I don't either. And not even allow a man a chance to, a man's family to mourn. Right. Um, because he believes this. Yeah. Now, can, having said all that, can you read the second part of question 24? And we're going to get ready to put up uh, chart number five in just a second. All right. This is uh, question 24B, second half of that. And here's what it says. If so, meaning if there is a difference between the rapture and the second coming, if so, then when does the rapture take place relative to the coming seven-year tribulation period? Can you uh, hand me there the next chart? Thank you. There is, Brother Jim, a war that's gone on for at least the last century or two in Christianity amongst people who believe in a tribulation period mm -hmm. and a kingdom that follows a tribulation period mm -hmm. and a rapture. Yes. And the debate is, <clears throat> when does the, as the question states, when does the rapture take place relative to the seven-year tribulation period? Mm -hmm. And as you can see from this chart, there are basically uh, four views on this. The first view at the top is the view that we think is the accurate view. Right. It's the view that Jerry Falwell believed and was criticized for, mm -hmm. and what Rick Wiles is all lathered up about. Yes. And it's the view of pre-tribulationalism that the rapture takes place before the tribulation period. Right. Competing against that view is the second one down there, mid-tribulationalism, that the church is raptured in the middle of the tribulation period. Probably one of the more popular views out there is post-tribulationalism, that the church right. is raptured at the end of the tribulation period, yeah. uh, which is very, very hard to sustain, in my opinion, right. because if the church is placed in their resurrected bodies at that point, which is what happens at the rapture, mm -hmm. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 through 58 says that, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 says that, then who is left to go into the millennial kingdom and repopulate it? That's right. Because we know there's going to be sin in the millennial kingdom. Yes, we do. So um, if the church is translated at the end of the tribulation period, everybody's in a resurrected body, mm -hmm. then who are these mortals that go into the millennial kingdom right. and repopulate it right. and pass through what's called the sheep and goat judgment? Yeah. See, your post-trib people don't have an answer for that. And hasn't, hasn't this been, had a real resurgent in recent years? I mean, uh, this was really popular back at the turn of the last century, right? Yeah. And then it died out. And now all of a sudden it's coming back. Yeah, it's very popular. It's, it's very popular in the scholarly community. Mm -hmm. And what you find is people don't give you specific answers to these questions. Mm -hmm. The question who repopulates the millennium is easy to answer from our perspective. That's right. We're raptured. Mm -hmm. There's going to be people that are converted in the tribulation period That's after right. the church is gone thanks to the evangelistic activities of the 144,000 Jewish evangelists. That's right. Revelation 7, verses 8 and following talks about an innumerable multitude that yes. gets saved during that yes. time. Praise the Lord. And many of them will survive. It's many of them, most of them will be martyred, mm -hmm. but many of them will survive to the end of the tribulation yeah. period. And they're the ones That's right. that pass through the sheep and goat judgment. Matthew 25, 31 through 46, and repopulate the earth yes. in, the, uh, in their glorified, excuse me, non glorified non -glorified, bodies. Non glorified, right. Mm -hmm. Along, along with believing Israel. Right? That's right. Mm -hmm. And then looking at the chart again, as if all of this wasn't complex enough, there's another view <laughs> called pre-wrath rapturism. And basically these are people who believe that the wrath of God really doesn't start until 
the middle of the second half of the tribulation period. Mm -hmm. So they believe that we're here for the first half and a good chunk of the second half of the tribulation period. Right. Um, and if all of this wasn't confusing enough, there's another view out there that I couldn't even put on this chart. It's so bizarre. Uh, it's called partial rapturism. Uh oh. Which means that only the believers that are submitted to Christ's lordship mm. with no sin in their lives, really okay. seeking the Lord, Here we go. are taken. Yeah. The rest of the Christians are left behind, mm -hmm. and the purpose of the tribulation period is to straighten out these carnal Christians. Uh, and as they get straightened out one by one in the tribulation period, there's individual raptures. The top view on that chart is the correct view. It's not just wishful thinking. No, it's hopeful thinking. Hopeful thinking, Less but not hope. wishful thinking. <laughs> and I don't think any one of these um, arguments in and of themselves seals the deal. Uh, but I think when you look at them cumulatively, yes. a powerful case emerges that pre-tribulationalism is correct. And I, I want to walk through these because I don't want people to feel like they're believing in some kind of fiction, fictional idea right. if they believe in the pre-tribulational rapture. Yeah. So here is reason number one. And if you don't mind looking up Jeremiah 30, verse 7, we actually have it oh, there got on it the right sheet. Here. Um, the, the first reason is the tribulation period concerns Israel. Say what? <laughs> And not the church. Hey, and we've something? done we've done a lot of teaching here in our ecclesiology class, and also our kingdom class. We teach ecclesiology uh, Sunday mornings during Sunday school. Right. We've been teaching the doctrine of the kingdom on Wednesday nights. It's good stuff. And we've made a big point about how Israel and the church are separate. Right. Now, Rick Wiles in that uh, video that we saw earlier denies that. He mm -hmm. thinks that. He believes in replacement theology, mm -hmm. that the church is now the new Israel. And we, we deny that, and we don't have time to explain all that. Uh, I would go challenge people to go back and look at those series Absolutely, to get yes. information on that. <clears throat> but the more you believe Israel and the church are separate and distinct in terms of different programs of God, the more you start to see that the church can't be on the earth during this time because mm -hmm. the tribulation period concerns Israel. Right. So do you mind reading Jeremiah 30, verse 7? All right, we're reading the, our scriptures today, as always, are going to be coming out of the New American Standard Version uh, 95 update. So in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7, uh, the prophet writes, Alas, for that day is great. There is none like it, and it is the time of Jacob's distress but he will be saved from it. So it's clear there it's talking about the tribulation period because it's talking about a time of unparalleled distress. Mm -hmm. And it's very clear that it's a time of trouble for Jacob. It didn't say church. It didn't say church. The church didn't even exist yet when that was <laughs> right. given. And we know that Jacob's name was changed to Israel mm -hmm. in the book of Genesis chapter 32. And I think also again there in chapter 35. And folks might want to just jot down Daniel 9.24, which says that the 70 weeks, including the 70th week that hasn't happened yet, right. is for your people, Daniel, mm -hmm. and your city, yep. which would be uh, the Jewish people and the city of Jerusalem. Correct. And then Daniel 12, verse 7 says the purpose of that time period is to finish shattering the holy people. Mm -hmm. The holy people in context is Israel. Yep. So the whole point of it is to bring Israel to faith. Exactly. The church already is in faith. 
Yeah. So there's no need for the church to be here. Yeah, I just don't think a lot of people understand that, that that's the purpose of the tribulation. Right. God's dealing with Israel. Exactly. You know. And that's why we're going through this. <clears throat> Uh, exactly. And there's a lot of confusion yep. out there yep. in addition to antagonism. The second reason, uh, number two, is there is an absence of any reference to the church on the earth in Revelation 4 through 19. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, the book of Revelation basically has uh, three parts to it. John says, write down the things that you have seen. That's yes. chapter one. Yes. The image of the glorified Christ. Write down the things that are. That's mm -hmm. chapters two and three. The letters to the seven churches. Then he says, write down the things that will take place after these things. Mm -hmm. That's chapters four, really through 22. Mm -hmm. The end time section. And Brother Jim, it's really interesting mm -hmm. to observe something. The church is mentioned about 19 times in Revelation one through three. And then once you get into that futuristic section, mm -hmm. which governs the tribulation period itself, mm -hmm. the church is never mentioned a single yeah. time as yeah. being on the earth. The word church isn't even in that section. That's right. And the Pauline description of the church, Jew and Gentile in one body, mm -hmm. Galatians 3.28, Ephesians 2 verse 14, that concept disappears. Mm -hmm. If the church appears anywhere, she appears in heaven. Revelation 4 and verse 5 talks about seven lamps. Now, in Revelation 1, it talks about the seven lampstands. Yes. Revelation 4 verse 5 talks about these seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which would be God's throne in heaven. Yes. That's where you find your church. Mm -hmm. And the word church doesn't even appear again until John signs off at the end and says, right. preach these things in the churches. Right. So the church is, very, is conspicuous by its absence. That's right. The word's not there. The, con the Pauline concept isn't there. Mm -hmm. And this is not just true with Revelation. This is true with any tribulation passage. Mm -hmm. No matter where you go in the Bible to study the great tribulation period, whether it's Jeremiah 30, verse 7, Daniel 9, verse 27, mm -hmm. Ezekiel 38 and 39, the book of Revelation, I would challenge anybody to find a reference to the church in any of those passages. Right. The best you're going to come up with is the word saints. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't identify the church at all no. because Old Testament Israel was called saints. That's right. Uh, in Daniel seven, yeah. so um, that you know, the I call that the argument of the missing church. It's mm -hmm. just very strange to me that if we're supposed to be here for all of this, there'd mm -hmm. be some kind of reference to us, unambiguous. You would think so. Would you mind uh, <clears throat> reading? I'm not sure if we have this on our sheet, so you might have to look this up. Revelation thirteen, and now. Of course, that I mentioned the passage. I don't remember exactly where it is. So we might have to go to plan B here in just a minute. But Revelation 13, I want to say it's, a, yeah, there it is in verse 9. All Would right. you mind reading that? <clears throat> and notice, folks, what's mentioned here and what's not mentioned here. Revelation 13, 9. Yep. All right. It says, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. Is that what we're talking about? Yep. Now, what's missing from there? When that phrase is used in Revelation 2 and 3, it always says, if anyone has an ear, let him hear what oh, yes. the Spirit yes. says to the church." That's right. That's exactly right. You get into the futuristic section, and it doesn't say what the Spirit says to the churches anymore. That's it right. says, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. And it yeah. just stops period. right there. <laughs> is that not evidence that the church yeah. isn't here during this time period? It would sure, you would sure think so. Yeah. yeah. So that would be the second argument. Uh, the third argument... Is, is this, the church is promised an exemption from divine wrath. Mm -hmm. uh, do you mind reading 1 Thessalonians uh, 1 and verse 10? Be glad to. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 <coughs> says, And to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. So we're going to be rescued from God's wrath. That's what it says. 
Uh, would you mind reading 1 Thessalonians 5, 9? Yeah, I love this verse. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And folks, jot down Romans 5, 9 and study that sometime. Yeah. Revelation 3, verse 10, study that sometime. I mean, all these prophecies say we're not candidates for God's wrath. Right. Jot down Romans 8, verse 1 and study that. So, so we are not candidates for God's wrath. And what is the tribulation period? It's the wrath of God. That's what it is. Can you read Revelation 6, 16 and 17? Right. Revelation 6, verse 16 and 17. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the presence of Him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? There you see the word wrath twice. Boy, yeah. That's describing the tribulation period. Mm. Uh, folks, jot down Revelation 11, verse 18. Your wrath came. Mm. Revelation 15, 1. The wrath of God is finished. It's the same Greek word, orge. <clears throat> Revelation 15, 7, the wrath of God. Revelation 16, 1, seven bowls of the wrath of God. Mm -hmm. Revelation uh, 16, 19, the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. Mm. What, what am I getting at here? I'm making just a very simple point. The point is we are promised an exemption from divine wrath. That's right. And the tribulation period is an expression of divine wrath. Right. So by definition, we can't be here. Just, just logic. Just basic logic. Now, we have a, a, a lot of people out there, if we can put up chart number seven, are trying to tell me that the wrath of God doesn't start until late. <laughs> when you look at this chart here and you look at the first six seals, does it read that way to you? And keep in mind, Jesus, Revelation 5, is in heaven, opening the seven-sealed scroll, bringing these things to the earth. Seal number one, the advent of the Antichrist. Jesus brought him to the earth by opening the seven-sealed scroll mm -hmm. in Revelation 5. Seal number two, global war breaks out. Mm -hmm. These are all in Revelation 6, folks, and you can see the addresses there on the screen. Uh, seal number three, famine breaks out. Seal number four, death breaks out. And this is where we learn that a quarter of the world's population is wiped out. Yeah. Seal number five, martyrdoms of an mm -hmm. epidemic proportion. Mm -hmm. Now, Jesus is in heaven opening a scroll which produces these things. And people are telling me that this isn't the wrath of God. Yeah. They're yeah. trying to tell me that the wrath of God really doesn't start until seal number six. Because that's the first time the wrath... Of, of God is mentioned. Mm. Let me ask you a question. Is the, is the flood in Noah's day the wrath of God? Yeah. I would think so. Wiped out the whole world's yeah. population other than eight. Yep. You don't find the word mm. wrath a single time. Not one time, no. Describing no. the flood. Right. And so this idea that we can't have the wrath of God until we see the word wrath mm -hmm. um, is, is silly, folks. The wrath of God starts immediately in the tribulation period. Yes. You know, we don't have to wait around until halfway through or three quarters through. Right. Or till the very end to get the wrath of God. And this is the logic that people use to keep the church mm -hmm. in the tribulation period. Yeah. The wrath of God has started instantaneously. Mm -hmm. And all Revelation 6 is recording at the end of the chapter is that the inhabitants of the earth finally recognize it. That's right. You don't determine when the wrath starts by when people finally recognize it's happening. Right. And that's why I like this quote here from Bob Thomas, and I think this would be slide number nine, if we can put that up. Um, I'm, I'm not necessarily going in the order of the slides that we set out to do, but look at this quote from Thomas, who wrote a wonderful exegetical commentary on the book of Revelation. And he's yes. commenting on the wrath, the word wrath there, that shows up for the first time in Revelation 6, 16, and 17. 
He says the verb elethin has come is an aorist indicative referring to a previous arrival of wrath. That's right. Not something that is about to take place. Men see the arrival of this day as at least as early as the cosmic upheavals that characterize the sixth seal, but upon reflection, they probably recognize that it was already in effect with the death of one quarter of the world's population, mm -hmm. a worldwide famine, global war and global warfare. The rapid sequence of all of these events could not escape notice, but the light of their true explanation does not dawn upon human consciousness until the severe phenomena of the sixth seal. Mm -hmm. And what he's saying is you don't need the word wrath to, to, to see that the word wrath, the, the concept of wrath is there. Yeah. What, what the end of the chapter there is revealing is the inhabitants of the earth finally figure out it's the wrath of God. All right. But if you're not going to say the wrath of God has already started, then you come to this ridiculous conclusion that not only is the Noahic flood not the wrath of God, but neither is a world war, a world famine, mm -hmm. worldwide death, and martyrdoms yeah. inflicted by Christ in heaven, yeah. thanks to the opening of the seven-sealed scroll. Mm -hmm. So when it says, folks, that we are exempted from divine wrath, you will not see one iota of the tribulation period. You know, those folks are going to be under the wrath of, uh, wrath of God during that time frame. You think that they're going to be worried about the word wrath? That's right. They're going to be experiencing it. They're going to know they're under the wrath of God. That's right. Now, a lot of people think we teach a doctrine of escapism. And if we could put up slide number eight. Uh, when people here are teaching on this, they, they say, well, you know, you guys are just into escapism and you teach, you know... <laughs> Nothing's going to go wrong in the life of the Christian until we're all raptured out of here, and then the world will go to hell in a handbasket, you know. And so they, they basically teach that we uh, teach a, a doctrine of, of a life free of troubles. And they say, what about your brothers and sisters in other parts of the world that are being martyred and all of that kind mm -hmm, of thing? Mm -hmm. Uh, this is this, this pre-tribulational doctrine is unique only to America because only in America have we seen a relative reprieve from persecution. And folks, um, we don't teach anything like that. No. What we distinguish are the forms of wrath. Sure. A Christian today is a candidate, as you can see from the screen, for ordinary trials. Yes. In fact, Jesus said in the world you'll have tribulation. He did. A Christian today is a candidate for man's wrath. And you can uh, see all the verses. We don't have time to look at them all. Well, we just saw some videos. That's right. Um, where uh, man's wrath is basically a promise to all who seek to live a godly life in yes, Christ that's Jesus. Right. Folks, we're candidates for the devil's wrath. That's why we've got to put on the full armor of God. That's right. We're candidate for the world's wrath. That's why Jesus told us very clearly in the upper room and the... You know, don't, don't marvel at the fact that the world hates you. It hated mm -hmm. me first. But mm -hmm. listen to me very carefully, folks. We are not, with a capital N, candidates for divine wrath. Amen. All of these forms of wrath we are candidates for and we experience. But you see, the tribulation period is beyond these different forms of wrath. It is. It's a more severe form of wrath. Mm -hmm caused by Christ in heaven who is opening the seven sealed scroll. That's what you're exempted from by divine promise. Yes. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, 1 Thessalonians 5.9, yes. Romans 5.9, Romans 8.1, etc. Yes. So we are not candidates for God's wrath and the tribulation period is an expression of Amen. divine wrath. That's good. Let's uh, see, and we're going to try to get the... Uh, questions ready that we can read because we're going to do our best by God's grace to stop within our hour time frame. We've, we've never done that before. And so I think to bless the people that have been patient with us with all of our technical glitches, we yeah. can, we're going to try to stop at 325. Begin so, praying now. <laughs> so if there are questions and comments, uh, now's the time for us to get those. And <laughs> as those are being printed, um, 
Let me give you one more reason, and we'll, we'll, we'll just continue with this list next week, because I think this yeah. is teaching that yeah. people need this to hear. This is good stuff. But <clears throat> the rapture, the way it's set up, is it's based on the doctrine of eminency. Yes. Eminency is the idea that the rapture can take place any moment. Any moment. Any moment. Um, Wayne Brindle has a four-part test in his Bibsac article, Biblioteca Sacra, which is Dallas Seminary's academic journal, mm -hmm. 2001. He's got a four-part test there for determining if a Bible passage preaches uh, eminency. Would you mind reading that four-part test to us? All right. The article is entitled, Biblical Evidence for the Eminence of the Rapture, and this is what Mr. Brendel writes. Four criteria may be suggested, any one of which indicates eminence. Number one, the passage speaks of Christ's return as at any moment. Number two, the passage speaks, speaks of Christ's return as near without stating any signs that must precede His coming. Number three, the passage speaks of Christ's return as something that gives believers hope and encouragement without indicating that these believers will suffer tribulation. And number four, the passage speaks of Christ's return as giving hope without relating it to God's judgment of unbelievers. Close quote. So if it fits these four criteria, it's speaking of the rapture. Mm -hmm. not the second advent at right. the end of the tribulation period. And the way the rapture is held out to the church is it's held out as hope. That's why it's called the blessed hope. Yes, amen. I don't know how much hope I have if I'm going to be plunged into God's wrath. Yeah. It's never made a lot of sense to yeah, me why, doesn't, people, why doesn't people promote that. But if it fits these four criteria, oh then it's talking about the rapture. Mm -hmm. And if it fits these four criteria, it's a passage you can use for the doctrine of eminency. Mm -hmm. Eminency is the idea that the rapture is the next event on the horizon. Right. There is no prophetic event mm -hmm. that must take place before the rapture. Right. The rapture could happen before we finish this broadcast. I hope so. And some of our crew, I think, may be praying, <laughs> praying for that. Praying for that to happen. Um, that uh, let's 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 do it this way. Mal Couch, mm -hmm. who we both loved, yes, is with the Lord now, yes, and also John Walbert, Dallas yes. Seminary. Yeah, you walk into their offices and they had a plaque. You, you know which one I'm talking about. Yeah. It said perhaps today. Yeah. Only a pre-tribulationalist can say perhaps today. That's right. If I was a mid-tribulationalist, I could not say perhaps today, mm. because 42 months of the tribulation period has to elapse first. Mm. If I'm a post-tribulationalist, I can't say perhaps today, because seven years of the tribulation period has to elapse first. Right. If I am a pre-wrath rapturist, I can't say perhaps today, because the rapture can't take place until the second half middle of the midst somewhere of the second half yeah, of the tribulation. Somewhere in there. Only we <clears throat> have the capacity to say, perhaps today. That's right. And that's what the doctrine of eminency is about. Yes. And <clears throat> I want to just show you a passage or two that teaches this. First of all, Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 15 says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we... So he's including himself. Including here, himself, right? alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. First Corinthians fifteen fifty one, Paul says, Behold, I tell you a mystery, we mm -hmm. will not all sleep. Paul thought this was going to happen in his lifetime. He did. He wasn't looking for an antichrist. Yeah, that's right. He was looking for Jesus Christ. That's right. And I don't know. Can you read uh, 1 Corinthians 1 7, an eminency passage? Yes. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 7, So that you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't say, hey, you know, uh, get, some, get, get your gun, 
Make sure you got a lot of copper bullets. Mm -hmm. Get some gold. Yeah. Get some freeze dried food. And a bunker. And a bunker. Because you're going into the tribulation period. Right. And you need to be the last man standing. Yeah. yeah. Now, having said all that, am I against having some supplies around your house? No. Am I against uh, owning a firearm? To me, having those things is just common sense in right. our fallen world. Right. But it's got nothing to do with my eschatological beliefs. Exactly. I don't have those things in my house because I think I'm going into the tribulation period. Amen. I have those things in my house because of the ordinary trials of life. Mm -hmm. That's right. But there's so many people that aren't looking for Jesus. Yeah. They're looking for the wrath of God mm -hmm. and they're waiting to eyeball it with the Antichrist. Yeah. And that is not the way the rapture is described. The rapture is described as the next event on the prophetic horizon. Yeah, and they're, they're waiting eagerly. Eagerly. Can't and the, wait. And this is what we call imminency. Yes. What, one more, Philippians 3.20. All right. Philippians 3, verse 20. I love this verse. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. What is he waiting for? He's waiting for Jesus. The revelation <laughs> of Jesus Christ. He's not waiting Amen. for the Antichrist. Amen. So this is my fourth argument why the rapture is before the tribulation period. The way the rapture is set up according to Wayne Brindle's criteria of eminency is it's the next event on the prophetic horizon. Right. Offering us hope. Amen. And any other perspective that you take pre-wrath, mid-trib, post-trib, and you ask them, can Jesus come back today? Mm -hmm. The way the New Testament describes it. Mm -hmm. they, no, none of them can answer yes. Amen. We That's are right. the only view out there. If you ask us, can Jesus Christ come back today? perhaps today, yeah. we can unapologetically say yes. And that's why we believe that's the biblical view. The biblical view. So you stack up these arguments. We haven't even gotten all of them yet. But you start to see, I think, a case for pre-tribulationalism mm -hmm. developing. Amen. The purpose of the tribulation concerns Israel, not the church, number one. Number two, there's an absence of any reference on the earth to the church in the tribulation. Yeah. Number three, the church has promised an exemption from divine wrath, and the tribulation period is an expression of divine wrath. Mm -hmm. And number four, because the rapture is imminent any moment, it must take place before the tribulation period even begins. Yeah. And folks, I know you're dying to hear points five, six, and seven. I am. So we're going to do a cliffhanger <laughs> and invite you back next week to study with us on this. That's and, good. Uh, before we sign off, let's get to a few questions. I think we can do this fast. One person writes in and says, Secret rapture? So these theologians have never heard of Enoch and Elijah. Good point. And, and she raises a great point there because there's many raptures in the Bible. A lot of people don't know that. Uh, the only difference this time is God's coming back for a whole busload of people. <laughs> Another person says, if people reject the rapture, I wonder what is their blessed hope. So sad, and I completely concur, it is sad. Yeah. Try to be, for one week, a post-tribulationalist. And look at how depressed you would be. Mm -hmm. Try the next week to be a pre-tribulationalist. Your whole mental outlook is different. It, does. it is different, yeah. Another person yeah. says, they call it a secret when millions of people suddenly vanish, question mark. Another person says, not true news. Oh, my soul. Such venom being spewed with outrageous air. He scares me, and amen to that. <laughs> Another person says, isn't Mr. Wiles vicious? I sometimes wonder if these folks will be left here if they obviously have no belief in it, no belief Jesus can remove them. Very sad. Well, if the guy's a Christian... Okay. Uh, he's going to go up kicking yeah, and screaming. Say, going up kicking and screaming. And it's a good thing he's going to be put in a resurrected body at that point where he won't be able to rebel anymore against God. <laughs> That's right. The, honestly, Brother Jim, there are some people when the rapture happens, they're going to go up kicking and screaming. Yeah, I, I, I think honestly you're right. believe that. You know, it's like the doctrine of grace. Why do people fight that? Yeah. It's such a beautiful doctrine, and yet people will spend their whole lives fighting that. And it's like that with the rapture. I mean, if there's a case that can be made, why not embrace the idea yeah, that we're not going into the yeah. tribulation period? I mean, do people, do people want to go into it? 
Um, another person mm. says, uh, Pastor uh, Andy Woods, what do you think will happen to those Christians who proclaim to know our Lord, yet reject all scripture relating to the rapture of the church? Well, I would just say that they're going to be you just answered. They're going to be surprised. <laughs> Another person says Noah is a picture of Israel and Enoch is a picture uh, of the church. That's an interesting parallel. I used to hear Pastor Chuck Smith draw some of these parallels. And what she's trying to say there is Enoch is taken before the flood. Mm -hmm. and so that would be a kind of a type of the church. Mm -hmm. And um, Noah is going to be sustained through the flood. Mm -hmm. That would be a type of Israel. Yeah and how God is going to preserve Israel. Uh, I would not push that analogy too far because we know that two-thirds of Israel is going to be killed That's in right. the tribulation period. That's right. But it is an interesting typology to think yeah. about. Yeah. Uh, J.D. Farag also of uh, Calvary Chapel. Kane Ohe. Yeah, Easy for you to say. Uh, has a great study on some of these types as well, typology. Another person says, why are some, particularly those who claim to be believers, so viciously opposed to the rapture? Is this the work of Satan? I think anytime someone is vitriolic against an element of truth, it is the work of Satan. Sure. And, you know, they get real mad when we say that. But the reality is they've called us that from time immemorial. Uh, I could, I don't even want to mention the, the ministry because I don't want people to go there and become aware of it, but... One ministry I can think of has produced a, a lot of material arguing that John Nelson Darby, mm -hmm. the Martin Luther really of the 1800s that mm -hmm. retrieved rapturism from the pages of Scripture, was following occultic practices. Yeah, and that's that's been so debunked so many times yes. over. But they believe our view is <clears throat> satanic. Uh, I believe this, and if anybody is visibly angry against ele any element of truth, they need to check get their heart. Check their heart before the Lord. That's right. Another person says replacement theology is the root of all evil. And I would have to concur with a lot of that because um, replacement theology, the idea that the church has replaced Israel, is a challenge on God's veracity and truthfulness mm -hmm. and His promises to Israel. His character. Another person says my, yeah, His character is at stake. Another person says my pastor is post-trib. It's quite difficult being the only pre-trib believer in a small fellowship of about 15. Oh, bless your heart. Yeah. It affects more teachings than I initially thought. And boy, I, I, I would have a difficult time being in a church like that. Mm -hmm. um, and what people need to understand is theology is like dominoes in a row. If yeah. you knock one over, it's going to affect other things. That's right. And if you start tampering with the Israel church distinction, and the pre-tribulational rapture doctrine, it's going to affect other things. Mm -hmm. You don't just knock the dominoes over. You, you mix them all up yeah. if you do that. It's a it's, it's seamless tapestry. Mm -hmm. Another person <clears throat> says so many mid-trib views think the tribulation will be only one to three years. Well, that's why we were clear at the beginning yeah. with the Bob Thomas quote that mm -hmm. uh, the tribulation period starts pronto. Mm-hmm in the seven-year process. Mm -hmm. It's right when Jesus starts unsealing that scroll is when the wrath of God starts. Mm -hmm. Another person says those who believe a mid-trib or a post-trib rapture are nuts. <laughs> Two-thirds of the world, I believe, are going to be destroyed. Not many will endure. See, this is what they do. They say, well, yeah, we're going into the tribulation period, but we're going to be preserved in the midst of the tribulation period. Uh, Pat Robertson for example, right. uh, was most people don't know this is is very post trib. Oh, yes. He's been that way for oh, yes. decades, and I remember watching him on the Seven Hundred Club, and that's what he would say. He would say it's like the Jews being protected in Goshen during the ten plagues. Yeah. Well, if God is protecting us from His wrath during the tribulation period, He's doing a terrible job of it because the martyrdoms are unprecedented during yeah. that time. Yeah. People that profess faith in Christ during that time are martyred. Yeah. So this idea that we're going to be somehow protected through all of this, just just read Revelation 7, read Revelation 6, yeah. read Revelation 13, yeah. read Revelation 17, read Revelation 18. 
the blood is going to flow yeah. uh, as high as the horse's bridles for 200 miles during this time. And many of those killed will be martyrs. Well, and it doesn't, it doesn't fit that, that uh, comparison at all because no. when you go back and look at the Exodus story, there's not any evidence whatsoever that anyone that God brought through the sea perished. That's right. Not it's, one person. It's an invalid comparison. Doesn't work. Apples and oranges. Another person says, is there a link where I can get the chart of the differences between the pre-trib rapture and second coming? Um, I'm, I'm seeing people, the crew there, shaking their heads in the affirmative, but I don't know exactly where to get that chart. Uh, why don't you... Well, you know what we could do? We could take these and scan them into a PDF file. Okay. And post them, right? Couldn't we do something yes. like that? Okay, yeah. We'll, we'll Thumbs do, up from the crew. We'll do that following the show, which yeah. is almost over, believe it or not. The crew, the crew feels like they're in the tribulation right now yeah. until the yeah. show ends. Yeah. Another person says... I'm all praying over there. <laughs> Another person says, what is the false peace the new leader or Antichrist brings in the first half of the tribulation is just is this just for the world or for Israel well I think it is for Israel yeah. and I think it's and that will last three and a half years mm -hmm. Daniel 927 but I also think it's temporary for the world sure because when the second seal is opened and war breaks out it says very clearly that peace was taken, taken from, from the, the earth, earth yeah. it's hard to take peace from the earth unless peace was established That's on right. the earth so there's some kind of temporal peace for the world. Mm -hmm. That's why the world loves this guy yeah. as their Messiah. But it's a three and a half year peace for Israel. Mm -hmm. And it's not until halfway through that the Antichrist betrays Israel. Yeah. Another person writes in and says, the Bible is clear. Rapture, Jesus coming to take his church. Second coming with his church. There we go. No place for confusion for people who want to see this truth. This is one of our uh, regular viewers from Croatia. Oh, So uh -huh. it's exciting to see our, our ministry expand Amen. Uh, out that far. So praise the Lord. And these Croatians are a lot clearer thinkers than most Americans, most seminarians. All right, look out. <laughs> Another person says, it is my blessed hope. So many people try to steal it. Other Christians try to steal it. And they do. I don't know why that is. Uh, misery loves company. Mm -hmm. Another person says, and this is our last comment. We're getting ready to wrap up, folks. If the rapture comes in the, mid, in the middle of the trib, then the reverse, then, uh, excuse me, the middle of the trib, then the verse 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 and 2 becomes false because there is nothing false about the Bible, so the mid-trib must be false. Now this is interesting because as you move from 1 Thessalonians 4, which develops the rapture, to 1 Thessalonians 5, which develops the tribulation period, watch the pronouns shift. Yeah. When Paul is talking about the rapture, we quoted it earlier, mm -hmm. uh, where do we quote that? I think it was in uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse, uh, the eminency, there it is, verse 15. 1 Thessalonians 4, 15. We. Yes. Mm -hmm. Watch the pronouns. You get to 1 Thessalonians 5. Mm -hmm. He says they. Yeah. Now, isn't that interesting? It is. Uh, and there's all the, it's so neat how the Holy <clears throat> Spirit is embedded all these little clues yeah. uh, where we can search this out and gain confidence. And this is the time in history to get certain on this, that Jesus Amen. is coming back That's right. for the church before the tribulation starts. Folks, this is so much fun. We're going <clears> to <throat> pick it up right where we left off last time. <laughs> and we're, at this time, we're going to sign off, uh, invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just go to Andy Wood's Pastor's Perspective. should come right up. We apologize that we had to shift uh, to another Facebook page, Andy Woods Ministries, to do this. But in short order, it's going to be on my personal page. It's going to be on the SLBC page. And probably within 24 hours or less, we're going to have it up on YouTube. 
So tell your friends about our broadcast and come and grow with us in God's word. I don't have any more uh, words to communicate. What do, you, do you have anything you want to say? I just say? want to leave them with this. Are you eagerly awaiting the return of the Lord? Yeah. If you're not, why not? Are you yearning or yawning? Oh, I like that. <laughs> That's not original with me. I stole that from somebody, but it's still true. <laughs> we'll see you next time. God bless you. We love God you. God bless. And keep us in prayer. Amen.